I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear that the housing market over the last few years has been absolutely absurd. From total panic and despair when the world shut down as COVID took off, to the unexpected mega boom which literally took every bank and financial institution by total surprise. People have seen their home values soar by 30% over just 12 months in some cases, and others have seen their offers on homes $200,000 over asking price rejected for there's someone else out there willing to go higher with all cash. For a long time, no one really knew what was going on, but we do today. We know exactly how the government and the Federal Reserve flooded the markets with liquidity to artificially prop up housing prices and how they didn't really expect their actions to be so successful. The work from home drive and the other schemes enacted by governments all over the world meant that demand for housing didn't even decrease as our economies shut down. It increased and that combined with tens of billions of dollars being spent on bonds directly tied to the housing market meant we saw the strongest housing boom in history. Now though, everything is changing. The Fed is not buying mortgage-backed securities anymore, putting an end to the historic asset inflation program, and people's real wages are decreasing every month as inflation soars while our incomes remain stagnant. And then there's the real kicker, the rise of interest rates which scares anyone with half a brain cell. In short, the housing market is looking unstable at best and like it's literally teetering on a knife edge at worst. Today, in this video, we're going to look at just what exactly is going on, dive deep into the details of the boom, the cooldown, and the eventual crash that just might be around the corner. So where did the housing market boom come from, and why did we see it in almost every country, not just the US? Well, basically, it's really down to the actions of our governments, and how every government, or almost all of them, in the West at least, tried really hard to ensure that economic activity didn't slow down and that we didn't fall into a recession when lockdowns hit. The memory of 2008 and the financial crisis was a serious motivator for politicians to actually take some action. Now, despite what some people say, this isn't actually a bad thing. The economic hit that we saw over 2020 and even 2021 wasn't from the virus itself, but from our reactions to the virus and in particular to the lockdowns. Our governments forced our businesses to close. They forced us to stay in our homes and to not work our jobs. It would have been pretty ridiculous if they hadn't at least tried to stop us all from going bankrupt. So they sent out checks, they blocked evictions and foreclosures, and they tried to stimulate the economy. What wasn't really expected by most people, but what seems blindingly obvious in hindsight, was that housing prices were going to explode. In some countries, there was fear of an instant housing market crash, especially in the UK where I live. Everyone started to panic that we would all lose our jobs, stop paying our mortgages, and prices would crater, so the government sought to increase confidence by reducing stamp duty, a tax we pay when we buy property. It turns out that this direct support wasn't actually needed, and it added fuel to the fire, spurring on a booming house buying and prices went up an awful lot as a result. And that's really the same story we saw from all over. There was too much support from governments, people often found themselves with more cash than before the pandemic, and a buying frenzy for homes begun. Again, it seems so obvious in hindsight that when people are forced to spend all their time at home, of course they would choose to move to a bigger house, with more room, a bigger garden, or a nicer location, but not many people actually saw this coming in advance. Now, in particular, what we saw was people leaving cities that were becoming a little bit infamous for being very expensive and giving people a poor quality of life. Cities like LA, New York, and London. The housing markets in many of these cities actually performed worse than you probably realize. Prices didn't go up by all that much, especially when compared with other places, and rents actually fell quite a bit. But in cheaper states, places a little bit further away from these economic powerhouses, the markets boomed like we've never seen before. I know you've heard about the meteoric rise of Austin, Texas and other cities like it, driven largely by those people who left California and New York now that they were finally able to. Now today, investors face a dilemma. Inflation is at its highest level in over 40 years. The Fed is going through a phase of aggressive monetary tightening and top firms are predicting stock market returns of under 5% for over a decade. Restructuring your portfolio has never been more difficult or more crucial. So where can you turn? Well, I've been advocating for alternatives for a while now and it seems like everyone else is finally catching up with even JP Morgan jumping on board. In light of this, new platforms have emerged giving us access to previously inaccessible assets like fine art through masterworks.io. 
They let you access their exclusive investments from names like Banksy and Monet for a fraction of what billionaires pay to purchase. Two thirds of billionaires around the world allocate between 10 and 30% of their overall investment portfolio to R, in part to diversify and because it's a natural inflation hedge and hedge against uncertainty. It makes sense. After all, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500's total return by 164% from 1995 to 2021, and they have exhibited the lowest correlation to equities of nearly any major asset class. Since 2020, Masterworks has now sold three paintings, with each returning over 30% net IRR to investors. And remember, that's after fees. If you want to get in on it early, all you have to do is go to masterworks.io, create an account, check out what they have and invest in their offerings. And my subscribers get to skip their waitlist using the special link in my bio, so make sure to go and check it out. Link as always down below in the description and the pinned comment. Now the truth about this boom is that home prices have gone up a crazy amount in places that actually don't really make sense. Small towns that really aren't that desirable and haven't seen any mass immigration have also seen sky high prices, it's just that it's been fueled by the people already living there and big business. It might not exactly be breaking news right now, but a few months ago, it was. Banks all over the world started to buy up Western homes at a pretty alarming rate. They used their huge cash reserves, often literally billions worth, to buy homes in bulk before they even reached the market, and in doing so, they throttled supply. In 2021, it emerged that BlackRock, one of the largest companies in the world, bought an entire subdivision of homes in Conroe, Texas. A bidding war broke out between institutions for a development of 124 homes that were brand new. In the end, they paid $32 million for the entire group, roughly twice what the homes would have sold for on the open market, and the builders didn't even have to shed out the usual fees for realtors and credit checks. The simple fact is, when something like that happens, ordinary people cannot compete at all. There is just no way for them to put forward an offer even nearly as compelling as one by a billion dollar institution. Since the boom though, since the work from home hype has started to die down and the new normal has come and mostly gone, the housing market has started to cool down. Prices have risen a ridiculous amount and most people just can't afford to transact at these new inflated prices so the demand for homes has already started to wane. Banks have also been showing signs that they're actually worrying about a potential crash and that has only been making it harder for people to buy homes. You've probably heard of it happening, but many lenders or mortgage providers don't trust market rates right now, so they're refusing to give mortgages based on a home's full value. They don't care that the sale price is what the true value of the home is today because they're worried that in the future, the sale price will drop dramatically and they'll end up unable to recoup their loans. Most immigration from larger cities to smaller ones has already happened, which means that the spike of demand that we saw in the wake of the lockdowns has started to ease as well. Consumer sentiment has dropped off a cliff recently and it's now lower than it was at the worst point of the 2008 recession. Now what that really means is that people aren't spending as much money as usual because they're worried about the economy, about the stability of their employment or their ability to pay their own bills. All of this and more has come at the same time and it's already started to influence the housing market. The rate of growth of property prices has been falling across the board and there are some cities like Boise in the US which have seen demand for homes absolutely collapse in recent months. The booming housing market that came in the wake of the virus that many people said would last for years has already shown signs that it's on its way out and the cooldown has begun. It's probably not news to you and it's certainly not news to me, but inflation is really high right now. Now, many of us have been saying that this was coming for over a year now, but to be honest, none of that matters anymore. What matters is that it is here and there's only really one way to fight it. Central banks have to raise interest rates and they did just that over a week ago. Inflation is really just an overheating economy, a market where demand is higher than supply. People bid against each other both in literal auctions and in standard everyday pricing mechanisms and they force prices up. The purchasing power of our currencies, whether it's dollars, pounds or yen, decreases and people start to feel the pain. Raising interest rates slow everything down. People take out less debt because it costs more money. They pay off the debt they already have because it costs more money. Businesses invest less in equipment, technology and people because it all costs more money. 
Savings rates even start to go up as banks start to return more to you in interest each year as well, and all of this together slows the economy down. It stops people spending, it reduces demand, and it eases inflation. Now, with inflation the way it is right now, it is blindingly obvious that interest rates are going to keep rising. But a lot of people don't seem to grasp just how important this is, and that's usually because most people have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, so they think they are insulated from interest rate rises, but sadly, that just isn't the case. Now, if you have a mortgage that is fixed over 30 years at a very low rate of something like 2 or 3%, then on the surface, you'd be right to think that interest rates rising won't hurt you. Your monthly payment will stay the same no matter what, and with inflation as high as it is, your mortgage will probably get inflated away anyway, so having that debt can seem like a positive. The problem with this line of thinking, though, is that it assumes that you are the only real actor, and that the only thing that matters are your monthly payments and nothing else. Now, this process of interest rates rising has already begun, but it didn't actually start with the Federal Reserve jacking up the federal funds rate by 0.25% the other week. Interest rates for mortgages have been rising steadily for three months now, from an average of 3% all the way up to 4.5%. Now, that's a huge problem because the price of your home is dependent on those who are actively moving house, selling or buying. It is not dependent on your circumstances or if you're just sitting happy making your monthly payments. Now, should the federal funds rate rise to something like 5%, which would seem very high to us today, but in the grand scheme of things, and according to historical precedent, really isn't that high, then everything would likely change. People looking to buy a house would not be able to get the same 2% mortgage that you have. They'll be stuck with a 7 or even an 8 or 9% interest rate. Now, while your mortgage of, say, $200,000 at a rate of 2.5% only requires $790 a month, the new entrant to the market, also with a mortgage of $200,000, would have to pay twice as much, $1,700 a month. They'd need a far higher income to afford the same house that you have, which means that the number of people who can afford to buy your home will shrink dramatically. It follows then that demand for your home itself will drop as well, and then the price of your home will fall with it. And of course, this would happen at every different price point. If the cost of a mortgage rises by 25%, then the base price of the home is going to have to come down to counteract that rise, or else there wouldn't be equilibrium in the markets and no homes would ever get sold. So now you still live in your home that has fallen in value. Hopefully not by too much, but if you only put 10% down, then there's a decent chance the debt on your house is actually larger than the value of the house itself. But as long as you keep making those repayments, then you really are fine. As long as you don't need to move house and you can wait out the market, within 5, 10 or maybe even 15 years, you'll be back in the green and all will be well. The huge caveat there is the if. When housing prices fall, a recession often comes as well. That means people who work as independent contractors or run their own businesses make less profit. That means people who work for huge corporations get made redundant and find themselves without a monthly income. Suddenly, many of those people who used to be able to pay their mortgages no problem have suddenly found that the opposite is true. They don't have a choice. They have to sell their home, which is bad enough already as prices have now fallen. But on top of that, the place they now move into requires a new mortgage with a higher interest rate. There are also thousands of other reasons why people have to move, and they don't just stop coming up when recession hits. Family problems, new children that you need more space for, elderly parents who need caring for, young children that you want to get into better schools. All of these are problems that require a move in location. Then, on top of all that, the prevalence of variable rate mortgages are actually increasing, which can seem great on the surface. A bank might offer you a measly 1% interest rate for the first five years, which seems great at first, but after those five years are up, you get forced back into the market rates, which leads to the same problems we just discussed. In Canada, a mortgage has to be renegotiated every five years, and in the UK, fixed rate mortgages past the five-year mark are incredibly rare to come by. The reality is that just because you personally might have a great low fixed rate mortgage doesn't mean everyone else does. And it also doesn't mean that the market won't be affected by raising rates either. We've already seen average interest rates for mortgages in the US increase by 1.5% over the course of three months. And that's with the Federal Reserve only increasing the base rate by 0.25%. Over the next year, I expect the base rate to increase by more than 3% from here. Higher interest rates are coming without a doubt. They are on their way. And so the question we have to be asking ourselves is if after almost two years of a booming housing market where prices rising by 30% isn't even unusual, 
people will be able to afford to buy new homes at those prices when mortgage rates are higher. Very simply, the reason I'm worried here is because I think the answer to that question is no. People won't be able to afford these homes at these sky-high prices, and that means the housing market will crash once again. It will take time though. This is not the same market as cryptocurrency. It takes months to sell even one home, so it will probably take around two years for the entire market to fall, but the fundamentals are all that matters here. The fact that homes are more expensive compared to our incomes than ever before, and the only reason this was feasible was because of 2% interest rates, which are already long gone, and the future certainly doesn't look so bright. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for all my own investments. There's a link in the description to this video's sponsor, Masterworks.io, which is a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up, so make sure to check it out and start protecting your portfolio from inflation today. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.